Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out to, uh, to this session on uh, reaching a global audience with apps optimized to engage users across phones, wearables, and TV. My name is Damon Wayans. Um, I, my brief history on me, I have, um, from the entertainment field, I've uh, been in that world for about 30 years, um, produced a few TV shows in Living Color, wife and kids, had success, some success in film also, written books, and um, I've thrown my hat into the uh, digital space. So um, I have a couple apps that have been uh, recently featured as Samsung Galaxy Gifts, Baboom being the latest as a game, and um, there's Flickdat and Didio. So I'm thrilled to know that everything in my life is not a joke. <laughs> um, I was here last year at the SDC and I talked a little about the future of mobile um, experiences across multiple screens and I've had some pretty good success expanding my own experience at developing and publishing um, entertainment apps and uh, today we're here to talk about reaching a global audience with apps across the various mobile devices and TVs. We have a great panel with us today to share their experiences and insights. First, we have Joe Perez, founder of Tastemade. Joe, can you tell us a little about Tastemade and sure. your role? Please? Yeah, so uh, we, uh, at, at Tastemade, we saw the opportunity to do what you guys may have seen, the uh, shows like the Food Network, Travel Channel, um, Home and Garden TV, uh, a lot of the food and lifestyle programming that was on television that was done 20 years ago. We said, what if we could actually cr recreate a cable network, but do it 100% on mobile and make it global so that everybody can participate uh, right away. And then also we said, why well, couldn't we also allow anybody that's a viewer to also be a star on the, on the network? So the app we're going to show you today allows anybody to create their own one minute food show. So you could be a Food Network star right from your phone and it's you know viewed both on the phone but also created on the phone. And uh, also are excited about uh, featuring it on the televisions and connected watches and televisions and all these other devices. So that's, that's kind of what we do and uh, we've been focused in, um, you know, right now I think our, uh, our total audience across YouTube and mobile is uh, reaching over 23 million unique visitors globally. Uh, we do about, you know, over 100 plus million views of video views a month and, um, and most of our channels are actually outside the United States. So it's something that um, most of our viewership is, um, you know, coming from outside the U.S and about 60% of it is coming on mobile. So people are viewing, whether they're viewing our YouTube content or viewing the app content, it's all on uh, uh, smartphones and tablets. It's an awesome app, awesome app. Um, Rich Smith is CTO of OpenPath. Uh, Rich, could you tell us about OpenPath and your role, please? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, 13 years ago, we had this crazy idea of uh, putting applications on phones, and it really was kind of crazy back then. So we saw that uh, people were using telecom less for phone conversations and maybe a little bit more for data. So we started Open Path products. And we started initially just with SMS and WAP, and we had some nice experiences with AT&T. And then as J2ME and Brew came along, we did more and more with that. So we had this fantastic Samsung A530, which I still love. It was this glorious little piece of uh, jewelry, in fact. So that was some of the first things we were developing for. And then, of course, as Android came along, we did that and all these other platforms. And we spend an awful lot of time now doing interconnected devices. So um, it's sort of interesting because we see a lot of consistent patterns. So in 2001, when we founded it, um, the uh, telecom industry had just crashed. And prior to that, the dot-coms had crashed. And it looked like a pretty abysmal time to start a business, but um, or a really good time, depending on how you look at it. Because we saw all these little sprouts popping up with new technologies and new APIs. And we saw companies like Samsung coming along with some really interesting phones. So we just sort of capitalized on that. And then likewise, we see these same trends now with you know watches and with connected things. So it's sort of a reinvention constantly of itself and uh, it just requires uh, a little bit of insight and artistry and a little technology to make it all happen. So it's a pretty exciting place. As far as me as CTO, um, I kind of have the best job in the world in the sense that I get to speak with really interesting publishers and you know, companies and even the occasional celebrity and uh, just to talk about ideas and share things and make software. Very good. And last but not least, we have John Shaw from AT&T. Um, John, can you tell us about AT&T? Aro and um, 
a bit about your role? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, as you know, I'm with a little company called AT&T. Um, <laughs> We, I'm with a developer program specifically. It's a pro, the first uh, carrier program specifically for software developers. Uh, it's almost uh, coming on 20 years soon now. Um, and we, um, the, the program itself really is uh, chartered to nurture a collaboration with the development community uh, to get innovative apps out there to, you know, to, 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 for customers. Uh, my role within the developer program uh, is pretty interesting. I specifically focus on developer tooling within the developer program. Uh, I have um, two tools I work with. One, uh, Arrow, which stands for Application Resource Optimizer. Uh, that particular product is designed for software developers and testers to help them optimize their mobile apps, or rather, optimize their apps and websites for mobile. So while you guys are focused on creating apps that has the greatest functionality for whatever your niche is, um, you may, be, may not be conscious of what's happening under the covers uh, with regard to battery drain, with regard to ex excessive uh, data usage. So our uh, application arrow basically goes in there like a diagnostic tool and tells you out of 25 mobile best practices uh, which ones you fall short on. Uh, so if you don't have caching turn on or if you're you know, downloading a 2K by 2K image to display on a phone, stuff like that, uh, we'll tell you about it. Um, so it's great for developers, for testers as well. Um, and then the other product that uh, we, we actually have is um, something called the Network Attenuator. We'll be adding that to the uh, Aero product next year. It's in beta right now, but uh, that, that's a pretty good one. If you're, uh, you know, most of us developers are sitting here in uh, Silicon Valley or someplace where you have great coverage. Um, how does that app going to behave when you, uh, when you have less than ideal network conditions, either let's say it's a 49ers app that uh, you can get a high level congestion uh, at the stadium, or if your app needs to uh, be working in a second world country or developing country. Um, well, we actually have something else sit on your phone. You can kind of software, through software, just change, if, change the settings to 2G or 3G, set high congestion levels, and see how your app's going to behave. And those, are all, those are all things that we provide for free uh, from at and Great. So designing great apps with a uh, focus on the phone is definitely an art, um, especially for apps that stream video content over the network. So extending these apps to span the range from small connected wearable screens all the way to large HDTV screens requires even more consideration. So having developed my first apps for mobile phones, I would be very interested to hear from our expert panel uh, what their opinions are when designing and optimizing their apps for multiple screens. So we'll start with Joe. Yeah, Can so you talk a little about what the benefits are for Tastemade to deliver its apps across the multiple screens? Yeah, sure. And I think um, maybe what we can do is we'll, uh, we'll kind of run through a little bit of the app and show you what we do. But it is, it is a, the challenge is very hard because what we're trying to do is actually create um, video over on a phone. And then you're trying to assemble that somewhat on the device and, and then in the cloud and then encode it and then stream it back down. So there's all these issues with what John was mentioning. There's this level of service uh, issues on both the upload, on the download, uh, where are, you know, the sparse co coverage, whether you're uploading or you're just trying to view a video. And then we have the market issue where you know, there's people that are um, in more connected markets, but then there's also people that because the app was you know, global from day one, we've got videos coming in from South Africa and Malaysia, Singapore, and we, while we're not able to get to every market right away. It's, it, you know, optimizing across all those networks is very hard. So one of the things we've tried to do is, you, I, think, I think the key point about building apps in general is that the whole concept of an app is that it has to actually do something. It has to solve a problem. So regardless of the technology we're going to talk about, it's what is the problem you're trying to solve first so that you can use technology in a way we don't overuse it and you don't um, you know, try to use things just for the sake of using them. So I think the challenge we had was trying to um, really understand what the problem we're trying to solve is. And then you, know, you can even change some of your business tactics. So for example, our app is uh, very focused on content. If you don't have the content, um, it's a city guide, a video city guide. So, and we're going to show it to you. Um, I just kind of walk through it here. But what it is, it's a it's a video city guide of restaurants and travel destinations and hotels and whatnot around the world. So you open up the app and um, it allows you to have basically a video guide. So instead of you reading a Yelp review or a TripAdvisor review about a restaurant, you literally can see inside the restaurant. We, get, we have a one-minute format and we're going to shoot a video here um, and show you how it's all done. 
but we have a one minute format that we keep people very um, structured on. So it's very much like, um, it's very formatted. And the reason for that is because there's a certain amount of, there is really a bit of art and science to this whole thing because there's a filmmaking art that we're trying to get. We're trying to get a specific looking video at the end of this. We're trying to control specific things. So we like to call it produced UGC. So UGC is typically, hey, I'm just gonna write up a bunch of, you know, write or shoot a bunch of video and it's gonna be user generated. But what we do at Tastemate is we actually took some of our filmmakers and we, we basically appified our filmmakers. We took them and said, what kind of cut would you use here? What kind of song would you use? And actually, we, we, we actually limited the library. So just like Instagram will limit your filters, we picked filters, we picked songs. They're licensed right clear, rights cleared songs, just to give you an example. So there are specific songs cut to a specific one minute loop that does a, does a specific flow. So I'm gonna show you this now. Um, we can gotta go to the demo. Let me show you what it looks like, so it's a lot easier than, than talking about it. So the first thing it does is um, you come onto the app and it's got a feed. And you know, similar to a lot of other apps you've seen, it's a feed, but the feed's all video. And these are all people that I'm following. Um, uh, first time <coughs> on the app, it actually asks you some questions. Do you like, um, you know, what types of cuisines do you like? Do you, like are you, do you really like breakfast foods a lot more than you like dinner foods? Do you like coffee? So we ask you a bunch of questions up front, and then we also give you a bunch of tastemakers in local areas to follow. So these are all different people. But what's really cool is you can see it's global. There's uh, episodes coming in from all over the world. And these are just, ha this happens to be my feed that's being, uh, oops, uh, that's being uh, curated for me. Hold on a second. Um, so when I go through one of these, let me uh, show you my activity feed as well. So these are, these are also videos that it shows me everything that's going on in the community of the areas I'm following. So I'm following some people in Houston, Texas. Atlanta, because we've got a lot of efforts going on. Again, this is very much a, there's a challenge because if you don't have content in those areas, you can't really have a, you can't have a good experience for somebody in Atlanta. So what we're doing is we're going city by city and literally <coughs> having uh, community efforts on the ground where we go and we find the best creators that know the most about that local city. And we have to get them on board and get them writing and doing things. So this one's cool. This one came in from, she's in Taipei. This is Eileen, but I'm gonna play you a video and. Just keep in mind, everything you're seeing here is 100% created on this phone. There's no editing, there's, it's just you shoot it, we tell you exactly what order to shoot it in, and you get to pick the songs and the filters, but everything else we produce. And again, that's that, it's a really a, trying to apply it to this, the, the use case. The use case is the world's taken plenty of videos. Plenty of people, I can, you know, we pull the audience, I bet you that everybody, all of you probably have gigabytes of data of video and photos that aren't gonna do anything on your phone. What we try to do is free all that data up and say, let's put it into an editable, you know, viewable show, and this is what we came up with. And, I'm, and we're also gonna show you the process. Hello, we are at Ice Monster. The spot is the most famous place in Taipei to get shaved snow, and that is that soft snowflake you deserve. So everything you're seeing here, the title card, the music, the, 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 the format where she talks in the beginning, all of this B-roll being shot, it's 100% produced by the app automatically. We just tell you exactly what to shoot. So we act as your field producer when you're out in the field. Here they're most famous for their mango shaved snow, so that's one you must order. So we got the middle that, part, we're supposed we to, you're supposed to tell the people what your, you know, the must order dish is. So it's very formulaic again. It looks like any TV show you've probably seen about food where somebody talks about the restaurant, shows us what it looks like inside, talks about the dish you should order. And then, um, and then there's all these gorgeous food shots. And again, because we're using all these great smartphones nowadays, it's, high, it's all created in HD. All right, when we stream this on a television, so you know, in full screen, it looks like it's a TV show. Um, so anyways, this, and the last thing is she gives a pro tip. So that whole formula is actually developed by us um, and we guide you down that path. And as you're doing it, you, can, you, could, you probably couldn't tell all the different tricks that we're doing there, but I'll give you a couple examples. The tricks we're doing is when she talks, the music ducks, right? And that's typically what you would have to do. You would have to take footage off a of DSLR, put it on a MacBook, use Final Cut Pro, and you would have to do all your ducking by yourself. The app does it all for you. So anytime it recognizes voice, it ducks the music. When she stops talking, it brings the music back up, keeps it all smooth, and then all the transitions of all the cuts are, we went through and we did a lot of this manually. We, it was, you know, it's, we took um, a lot of the uh, components and we said, what would it look like? What would a perfect video look like? And we shot a bunch of videos, edited them in Final Cut, and then we looked at them. Like we had like a film festival and all of the engineers looked at it. And we, we said, yeah, it's kind of boring. Or that's too long. And then we said, when we got to the format we like, which was one minute, um, and it's kind of a, 
it looks a lot like uh, diners, drive-ins, and dives on the Food Network, or it looks like Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations or Parts Unknown. It looks very much like a typical food show. But when you crunched it down to a minute, we then said to our developers, can you, can you reverse engineer what we built? And can you get the artistry and the, you know, the, the, the beauty of what we shot and all of that storytelling? Can you recreate it so that anybody can do it? And that's, that's why I really want to stress application. It's like, what's your problem you're trying to solve? And then you have to back into it. And these guys are the guys that helped us do it. So you know, working with OpenPath to develop this, um, as well as uh, John's team to optimize it, it's, it wasn't just like a simple, hey, we're going to make this app and we're going to release it. There was so much in the network stack and on, on the device that you have to do. And that, you know, obviously, there's fragmentation as well. You have to deal with different devices. What can they do? And to get it all out to actually work. So that's, uh, that gives you a little bit of taste of what the videos look like. But I want to show you how it's created, because I think uh, it's important to see, and these are the challenges, again, working with Rich and, and the team is this, isn't, this just wasn't a very easy app, but, but our goal was can you make it easy for the user? And that's the most important thing is can you make it dead simple? And uh, so when you click on it, let me show you what it does. So the first thing it does, and, and keep in mind, again, this is, these are the, the details of everything in this app that has to be simple. We automatically look at Foursquare and see what restaurant you're next to. So there's Good Morning Cafe is somewhere near this area. It pre-populates it. And what's actually happening on the back end is picking a song that matches that, that genre of food. So cafe, there's a whole like, genre of food. And we actually look at the Foursquare data, and we map it to 18 different songs. And we de determine. So if you came in and it was a Spanish restaurant, it'd pick a Spanish song. If it was more of a Mediterranean restaurant, pick a Mediterranean song. But my point here is I want to stress is that we are making decisions for you. Because what the app actually does is it makes you more creative than you actually are, just like Instagram does. <laughs> Instagram makes you a better photographer than you are, and Tastemade makes you a better filmmaker and show creator than you actually are. And so, that, but that's, a, that's the, I think, the lesson for everyone here is that you have to, it's not just about, again, the technology. It's about what are you going to do to apply the technology to do something that literally creates consumer magic. You know, it has to be magic for the consumer, or else how many other apps are in the App Store, right? There's plenty of apps in the App Store. So if you don't get something that's magical, then, so, so everything I'm showing you, I'm trying to show you all the places that we tried to create magic. So, Magic is here. Somebody opens the app and they say, holy crap, I'm in this restaurant and it totally read my mind and knows where I am. The next thing we did was we said, let's put you kind of like what Twitter did. Twitter said there's 140 characters. If you want to get creative, go for it. Get creative in that 140 characters, but it's never going to change. We're going to keep you in a constraint. And we call that a creative constraint. So what we did was we put, we only I'll ask you to do five things. Shoot the intro, shoot B-roll, ambient shots of the restaurant, shoot the meal, and then... Uh, tell us a little bit about the food, and then do a wrap-up, so do a pro tip. So we actually do all that, and you can, um, you know, we, we, we very much make it like a little bit like a game where you're progressing through this, uh, you know, as you go. But I'll do a little selfie here and uh, just show you how we make one. So I just touched it, I just touched it and it's going here to the app, and, it's, and uh, I'll do my intro here. So we are here at uh, the Samsung Developers Conference uh, on stage doing a demo here of the Tastemade app. Uh, great food here, served every day. Don't forget to get the snacks, uh, and uh, I hope you ate some lunch. So uh, that's just like, you know, you can turn around and do a selfie, or you can shoot somebody else. We then asked you, and this is really important, our, our use case was, if you want to come to a restaurant, I want to be better than what Yelp or TripAdvisor, these text review sites do. I want to actually take you into the restaurant. I want to literally teleport you into the restaurant. Unfortunately, we're not in a restaurant today, so I'm going to have to, uh, you know, the ambiance of this place is not very restaurant-like. I'll take a picture of the crowd here. So you can see that these are now hashed marked. So we were very deliberate. We said, you can't now shoot just one big video. We're going to take three second B-roll shots. So when I go like this, it's actually shooting B-roll. And the B-roll, what it's actually it's also doing is it's dropping out the audio in the B-roll. So it's not going to record um, any of the audio. Hold on a sec. It's stuck in recording here. Uh, so it's going to drop out the B-roll, and then, whoops. And then it's going to uh, let me t just shoot the, um, just shoot, you know, imagery. And so the whole goal there was let's, let's uh, try to get, um, I think we lost our connection here. Sorry, guys. Hold on. There we go. Hold on. Somebody didn't charge the There's a little, the yeah. No, there's, it's charged. It's just, uh, <laughs> we got some gremlins in the, uh, in the cord here. Hold on. What did they say in the keynote? That uh, no CEO would ever do a live demo in front of a big <laughs> We're almost guaranteed something to go wrong, but we're going to keep going here. So let's see. There we go. We're back. So um, 
Let me go to the creation screen here. All right, there we go. So let's shoot, shoot five clips of the Dent venue. And uh, so I'm going to take some shots of, let me take a, this beautiful vintage of water here, the crystal geyser. So you can see I can do some really, just some basic shots. And because we're shooting on an HD camera, you know, it looks, uh, obviously it looks really great. And when you project it, that was a big part of our problem too, is we wanted to solve the problem of, you know, projecting this uh, onto a television. Uh, let's take some shots here just to give you some idea of the, some of the camera tricks we can do of it. Um, but yeah, if we had some restaurant footage here, this would be a lot more uh, pretty with the food. But uh, you can see I took those clips and now it's going to put them in his B-roll. And you can totally upload the video right now as is. You can just put it up and it's going to bake the show and it's going to do all the magic for you. But if you didn't like the song for some reason, you can pick from uh, all these different songs. And again, if it was a French bistro, it might be more like this song. If it's a you know, ribs place, we have uh, you know, like more something like that. Um, we're going to pick this song called Lotus. So you can see it allows you to actually feel what the, the episode is going to be like. And the last thing you can do is uh, add some filters, but I'm just going to hit preview and show you how we, uh, this video starts to get produced now. At uh, the Samsung Developers Conference, uh, on stage doing a demo here of the Tastemade app. Uh, great food here, served every day. Don't forget to get the snacks, uh, and uh, I hope you ate some lunch. See, it takes, the, it takes all the B-roll and it assembles it, and the audio levels go up, and it produces the episode for you, and then we'll shut it down at the end and then create like a show bumper. And then this immediately goes up to the, to the app, and then everybody gets to experience that. So I think that, uh, you know, that kind of just shows you, I think that's uh, in, kind of important to just walk through what the, what the actual uh, software does so we can talk about the technical challenges of actually executing that. So, uh, yeah, just in terms of, I'll, I'll just kind of walk through that and hand it off to Rich, but um, kind of talk through a little bit of what happened there. So when you're in that, that view, a lot of that stuff's happening on the client side. We're, you know, recording the videos and we're compiling them, and then, but the assembly is happening on the device as well. But once it's all baked, it then has to go up, it has, the entire um, assembled file has to go up, has to get encoded. So you have to have some, you know, again, quality service on the network on the upload side, hits Zencoder that where we encode it and we crunch it to get down and then we have to then bake it and make it available. And that all has to happen. It's not as easy, obviously, as taking a picture and, 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 or, and or putting a filter on it. We have to do all that stuff, crunch it, and then it has to bake and then we have to have it available for the user to, to view on the uh, consumption side. So in terms of that, I mean, maybe you can speak to some of the challenges of the studio was one of the hardest parts to make on this app. Because uh, we're dealing with video, we're dealing with um, you know compiling video and then encoding it and all that. So I think maybe that might be helpful for you to chat about some of that. Sure. Um, but I do think it's a truism of engineering that um, a sign of good engineering is when you take something really complex and you make it look really simple and really um, elegant. So at least I think that was certainly your goal with this. Because as you said, uh, certainly from the programming side as well as from the optimizing side, but more importantly from the cinematography side, there's just a lot of complexity that goes into here. But the fact that um, even I could do something that looks somewhat artistic, I think is a pretty neat accomplishment. And one of the things that uh, Joe kept um, telling us and reminding us as we were working with him and his team was this whole notion of magic, as he said, that you know, it really should practically look like magic regardless of all the bits and bytes that you're pushing around behind the scenes. And I think there are a couple of principles that um, apply all the time, you know, to any type of mobile de development, whether you're using a watch or, you know, a smart uh, phone or whatever, and they certainly applied here. Um, I don't want to sound like the, uh, the panel historian, but I had a chance to go through some of old uh, presentations that I was giving over the years, and I saw one from 2002 in CTIA, and uh, I had an opportunity to be at a panel kind of like this, or a little presentation, and the topic was uh, mobile apps, and maybe, maybe 100 people showed up mostly out of curiosity, because everyone thought that was kind of a silly topic to be talking about, but I actually wrote down the bullets, you know, I was like, all right, if you want to build something for this new generation of mobile apps, there are four things you need to do. And one is you need to respect the form factor, because we're all coming from a desktop and a web perspective. So we're, we're trying to emphasize that you have to recognize that this is a brand new way of doing things and a brand new form factor, and you have to kind of let go of the old and embrace the new across the board. And then I said that, uh, you know, these are connected devices, and you should leverage that, but you have to be gentle with the networking, because, uh, you know, you really can't expect, especially with these small devices, and I think now certainly with watches, the same thing apply. Uh, and even certainly, as you were saying, 
you know, in third world countries or in a stadium or, you know, at a trade show where things act kind of weird, you know, you never know what's going to be happening. So you have to be mindful of your networking. And then you have to be mindful of battery because it's good to remember that these devices, whether big or small or worn or whatever, are typically running off a of battery. So you have to be really careful of that ultimately if you want to have a good experience because we can have the best technology in the world, but, you know, if it doesn't work or if it eats all your battery or it makes the consumer mad, then it's probably not such a good technology after all. Yeah, and on the eating battery side, uh, there's a couple things that eat the battery here are GPS. We'd like to know where you are all the time as much as we can so that we can contextually bubble up the best videos on the consumption side. But then when you're recording, obviously, there's just the cameras flowing and you're just, you know, trying to, re there's a lot of battery issues. So I think the guys did a good job of trying to optimize as best we can to, you know, get that battery life, uh, keep it long. I mean, there, there's two, two table stakes, two items for table stakes here, and you guys spoke to it already. One was battery. If your device is dead, that's not gonna, that app's not going to be interesting to you, obviously. Um, the other is um, your data plan. So if, the, if that app is excessively downloading data, it shouldn't be downloading. It's impacting your data plan. You're not going to use that app as well. Um, there's, there's some interesting surveys with regard to performance. When, when I talk about performance, I'm talking about speed as well. I know it's tastes made. Yeah. It comes up pretty quickly. Yeah. Right. Um, CompuWare did a survey about a year or two back, and they said that uh, about 80% of the people they surveyed expected an app to come up within three seconds. Yeah. And three seconds is about how long uh, Russell Wilson has that ball before he yeah. lets go of it. And isn't it um, cool that it starts off with a video as well? Like you immediately feel exactly. like you're in the world. Keeps you engaged. Yeah. And, it, and we at at uh, AT and T, we actually have a team of engineers who look at our network, look at the apps that consume the most data on our network, and then uh, do analysis with Arrow of those apps and reach out to those developers. And you'd be surprised uh, what apps actually come up on that list. Uh, be the most popular ones that you you, you use, and they'll they'll do very fundamental fundamental things like they won't even cache their data. Uh, yeah. They'll download image sizes that are much larger than they need to be. Or if they, when you turn the phone over from porch to landscape, they download a whole different image on that. Um, stuff like that, yeah. just very fundamental stuff. Um, and that's where we come and we hopefully, with the diagnostic tool, it helps you with that. I think some good apps also have that situational awareness. Like if it can actually prompt you. We know that you're going to be creating great big videos here and you want to just wait until you're under Wi-Fi to do that, which I think yeah. is certainly a nice thing that consumers expect, but not everybody really does that. Yeah, and that's even one of our best practices as well, offloading to Wi-Fi. Yeah. It certainly tastes me does that. <laughs> yeah. So what kind of guidance, John, can you give for uh, delivering a great user experience across multiple screens? Um, so across multiple screens, it's, it's, it's back to the, uh, well, I guess, yeah, it's back to table stakes, I, th I think, with, with regard to just making sure that, um, I mean, we, with, with our tooling, it's less about the, um, the functionality and more about performance. Um, so it's, again, making sure that that app will work and not impact them. Um, because I know if, if you're like me, if you download an app and, and it eats up your battery pretty quickly, and I'm sure we've seen a couple apps do that, we'll immediately go back and think, you know, what app did we download yesterday uh, mm -hmm. since our battery started dying and start uninstalling this stuff. Um, and that, that's pretty critical. Um, the other thing that we, as, as uh, wearables start becoming more predominant, um, and which have smaller batteries, uh, as Rich spoke to, um, we, we're, we're working at uh, enhancing Arrow to look at uh, that data usage between that Bluetooth pairing, between the phone, uh, your wearable and your um, smartphone, um, and make sure that isn't excessively eating up your battery as well. Do you mind if I do a plug for Arrow? Please, please, app, anytime. <laughs> so um, just in case you all haven't seen it, Arrow is this nice tool that all the engineers at AT&T came up with. And uh, it's been around for a few years, and we've sort of been watching it off and on. And then uh, in the beginning of the year, John uh, reached out and reminded us that it's out there, and we checked it out, and we started to uh, use it more and more. And then we realized that it really is an essential tool for how we want to do things. So basically, the idea is that, um, and of course, Tastemate would never have these problems. But um, you know, with some apps, maybe we've seen that uh, they just seem really slow, and you're not sure why. And then you can run it through a tool that independently would tell you things that eventually you would sort of realize on your own. Like, gee, the, the video that I'm creating here actually doesn't need to be 30 megabytes. Just you know, for, given the form factor that it's going to, you know, it can be two instead. Or you know what? Um, I'm actually downloading the same thing the same image every time I scroll up and down instead of caching it locally. And because I'm testing on a really fast phone on a Wi-Fi network, I didn't really notice or really care. But uh, eventually, the testers would have found it as we test in different configurations. So um, it does a nice job of finding things like that, right? So that's absolutely. If we can advance, uh, I think there's one slide uh, up. They, they have some screenshots of Arrow. Yeah, let me see. 
Okay. So error basically consists, consists of two pieces. One uh, is a data collector that captures traces uh, on your smartphone. And well, we, when it shows up, we can speak to it. But the, the second one is it takes, collects those, uh, takes those traces and then analyzes against 25 mobile best practices. So there you go. Uh, so on the, on the bottom left-hand side, it, it provides a very detailed uh, eye chart, if you will, of what's going on behind the covers on your phone. Everything from uh, battery drainage to what the, what the data packets are, what peripheral devices are, are being used, uh, what URLs you're reaching out to, all, all that stuff. Um, painstakingly, a lot of information. Um, but as a product manager, as a tester who wants to do progre uh, regressive testing, um, regression testing, excuse me. Uh, if you look at the upper right-hand corner, we essentially do analysis of all that data and give you a, a pretty much a scorecard um, of those 25 best practices, which ones pass, which ones fail, which ones you should look at. And then if, you, if in the UI, if you click on any of those, uh, we'll actually take you to tips, tricks, code snippets, all sorts of things that can help you address those particular issues. Um, so, you know, as a developer, when you're feverishly in the heat of battle, uh, trying to put in that new feature, you may introduce something, or maybe you bring a new ad library in, and you don't realize that that ad library is pinging the server every 10 seconds. Um, our, our, our full test can take care of that and, and do it very object, in a very objective manner. Um, and, and that, I know, you guys incorporate into your processes, development processes as well, right? Yeah. We do. We actually put it in two places. So we have um, testers and developers all that operate out of Annapolis. And um, during the development process at the beta stage, we just have all the developers just run it through there, just as sort of a check mark that we have to go through. And the reason is that when beta, you're kind of far enough along that you pretty much have all the networking worked out the way you want it to be, but you are still got enough room left that you can change things if you need to. So we'll put it through Arrow, and we'll say, oh, you know what? Um, there's no cache control headers being sent down. Let's talk to the server team, get them spun up, and make sure. And then if anyone has any doubt, it's really easy because you can cheat, and you can just click on one of these links. It sends you up there, and there's this very erudite exposition about why you should do this. And you just send it to them, and you're like, well. And you feel, again, like a lot more smart yeah. or creative or whatever than, you know, than maybe I am. But it's a lot of good data. So you're basically taking all the, the engineering expertise from AT&T is looking at it from the back end, and you're applying it in practice in very practical ways to the, to the work that you're doing. And then we also have um, uh, our testers during the release candidate phase. They'll run through it as well. And you know, they have a little checklist of things that Arrow can find for them. Like, for example, am I really pointing to uh, the dev server and not to the stage server, you know, which are one of those things that can happen if you're not really careful. So it gives the testers direct insight into the networking that's going on and making sure that you know, I really did uh, turn off this analytics engine that I thought I did. And I'm not seeing all this crazy traffic going up to analytics engine B that you know, I, I didn't really want that kind of thing. Well, one more answer to your question, David, yeah, was uh, the, about the um, multiple screens challenge. I think with us, we're, uh, we've got a, uh, um, a device <coughs> on the Gear S that uh, we can show you, a, 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 basically an adaptation of how the app would be used specifically for the watch. And then um, we also have this multi-screens you know, kind of challenge where we've got watch and then phone, tablet, as well as the TV. And for us, we, I think, I think the, the kind of the lesson is in terms of design is how, are you de how do you design your app for, again, the, the, the problem you're trying to solve? For, so for us, controlling the, you know, what um, videos and, uh, you know, places that are around that you might want to see um, are great to see on the watch and just to glance at, especially if you just came to a city and you're looking for a place to eat that night, that's really cool. But then um, being able to also use that to, um, to drive videos and control them on your television is, a good, again, if, if you are trying to understand how to make that better. It's really trying to understand the different applications to each of the screens. And for us, you know, at creation, it's very important that the videos come out at very high definition. Um, so recording in HD and then being able to show it on a television is, you know, important to us. So we, we really looked at the entire problem and said, how would we use the big screen, the tablet screen, the phone screen, and then the, um, and then the watch? And they're all very different applications, and they're very simple. On, on some of the screens, they're just dead simple. It's just like do one or two things and don't do anything else. So I think that's kind of part of the challenge, too, with these multiple screens, is how do you, under, how do you take your overall app and decide what parts of my app am I going to put on these screens and what's going to be what I would call the killer app for each of those screens. So the t television for us is a, the killer app for the television is the view, lean back experience. 
right? We want it to look HD great. We also want it to maybe play more programmed like television so you can lean back and watch it. So we might bump a video next to another video. So when you're done watching one, we kind of gracefully put you into another one. Um, and then with the watch, it's very much more about I'm on the ground and I want to know, I want you to alert me to all the great restaurants nearby that somebody's made a video of. And that's very specifically a different use case, right? So I think that would be, you know, an answer to your question is, when you're thinking about design, you have to think about holistically, how am I going to use all these screens and what's the highest and best use for each screen? Or else you end up with a potpourri, I call it feature casserole. You end up with a bunch of features on all these devices that are just because you think you need them, but you really don't. So really be careful about, about that. Yeah, if I could add to that. Um, so at ATT, we, we also have a, a part of ATT, ATT that does UVerse, which is our cable set-top boxes. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we have various APIs for uh, both iOS and Android for you to share your screen. So one example app that uh, one of our partners did, which I, I think speaks to it just like Tastemade does, uh, is a poker game. So if you think about playing poker, generally you're going to have your own hand, and then you're going to also be uh, you know, seeing what's on the table if you're playing uh, Texas Hold'em or something like that. Um, so in, th in this case, depending if you're an iOS or Android device, you can see your own hand on your smartphone or your tablet. And then on the large screen on the TV, you can see what, what's on that table. Um, so it's more of, like you said, kind of working with the medium and um, working what's, uh, doing what's natural for that medium. I think that whole companion uh, experience is really integral to a lot of the things that we're doing. And I think we saw it in the keynote, and as Joe was mentioning, just that kind of that seamless connection between your things um, is really, really important. Um, and if I can say a little bit more about the whole TV experience and our hosts at Samsung, we found that they did a really nice job with all their SDKs and making it pretty easy on us. So when we're playing the video right now, all we do is just show the little Samsung, you know, connect blue icon down at the bottom when we're paired. You just click it and then, you know, it shows you all your TVs around. You click the one you wanted to go to and up it pops on your big TV. You know, the pairing process is super easy as well. So I say there's that TV, it finds it, and then the TV, for the first time you pair, all it says is, hey, this phone wants to talk to you. Is that okay? You click OK and then you know, it all just starts magically working, and then from then on, I can just go ahead and share it, just like Joe showed, but, you know, it would be separately uh, streamed out to your TV. And I think the net result we found, it, it was a pretty seamless experience. So I can sit on my watch, and I can play and pause it from the watch uh, while I'm watching it on the big old Samsung TV. So yeah. it, it's just really cool. So, um, John, how does AT&T look at the next big opportunity for delivering apps to each of these screens? Um, well, as I mentioned, uh, for, for UVerse, uh, that's, that's one example where we uh, expose APIs and kind of let the developers come up with uh, what they come up with because, we're, you know, it's, there's a lot of ideas out there and we, we definitely don't have uh, a monopoly on that. Um, well, what, one of the things we, 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 since the company is pretty large, we do have a lot of different initiatives going on. And we have a developer summit that happens um, every January. So right before CES, we have a three-day conference, a two-day hackathon, and a conference uh, where we make a lot of these uh, forward-looking announcements, trending uh, discussions, uh, as well as uh, let developers uh, get their hands on this technology. Uh, as a developer program, we hold about 30, about uh, three dozen hackathons a year. Um, this, so this by the end of December this year, we'll, we would have uh, had. Uh, about 4,000 developers go through these hackathons with about 500 apps that they've developed. Uh, so really just engaging the community with what APIs we have, um, as well as having a developer council that kind of gives us some guidance as well. And that conference is where we first learned about Arrow again as well. So it's kind of nice just to show up and see what the latest things are being cooked up. Yeah, so, so if, if you guys are uh, you know, in the neighborhood in Vegas uh, a couple days before uh, CES this year, um, drop on by. Um, registration is actually free for that. Okay. Um, Rich, can you uh, comment on what's next for uh, OpenPath um, the, and their efforts to support developers oh, uh, that are coping with multiple screens? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think for us, at least, attending events like this is really important. It's nice just to, A, not only see all the presentations and all the examples and demos and stuff, but also to be able to talk to other developers and see what other folks, you know, out in the room are actually doing. And, you know, that's where the best ideas come from. So on one hand, we're technologists, right? So we'll look at the latest APIs and we'll figure out how to do them. And we do a lot of R&D. And then we try to, you know, figure out how that helps our customers. But I think Joe really hit it on the head where, you know, technology is great. And it's fun to have the latest APIs and widgets and gadgets and stuff like that to interconnect. But if you're not solving a real problem, then <clears throat> you, know, you need to go back to the drawing board. So for us, at least, and at least for me personally, the best part of the whole process 
is um, really just sitting on the whiteboard and saying, hey, I just learned about this new multi-vice SDK that uh, Samsung is rolling out in addition to AllShare, and here's how it could be really cool, Joe. And Joe could say, well, that's great, but you know, where's the magic in here? And then from there, you start to work it out. Because I think if, if you're not solving problems and if you're not doing something to, to make um, the world a better place, then you know, your technology needs to be evaluated for what it's doing. OK. And Joe, what's next with Tastemate? And uh, what are you excited about? in terms of delivering a, a great user experience for uh, your customers? Yeah, I think, I think for us it is the, the multiple screens because that's from the very beginning. The company is about two years old now, and from the very beginning we always wanted to really disrupt television. And what's interesting now is television is it's come full circle. Uh, you can basically get digital-only programming direct to your television. But the beauty of that is that you can watch it on a tablet and a phone and, uh, and also get, um, on, on our, in, in our particular case with the watch, it's much more about a very specific contextual programming case. Like if I, if, um, you know, I know exactly where you are and I can program and I can bubble up things that are personalized to you. The other things uh, in terms of the next act for us is really collecting, we're collecting now more data on people. So we added a feature recently where you can add uh, restaurants and places of interest to your a wish list. So when you go into, like before I even go to New York, I can watch videos and there's a button that says must go, must go, and you just keep hitting it. And as you hit it, it's adding it to your must go list for New York. When you land in New York, we program that content onto the phone, but then also with the watch, what we're excited about is that we can <clears throat> literally say, there are three restaurants you said you wanted to go to in New York, here they are, um, would you like me to do some action? Whether eventually that's booking a reservation or if it's just you know, doing something else, like at least knowing it's there. So for us, that's really important. Uh, you have to collect the data first and then we can program back to the people with more contextual personalized experiences. But what's really cool about that is it's probably some of that stuff is much better done on a watch than it is on a phone because it's just a little, you know, it's more like notifications in that sense, but they're more, they're very um, personalized because we've got real data and you've been telling us things. So that for us is, uh, is kind of the next, the next few things that we're focused on. I think the personal aspect is kind of important as well because at least for me it's important to remember that, <clears throat> you know, as I move from a PC and a desktop, you know, that I would just leave at home at the end of the day and then now I have things that I'm carrying around with me all the time and they're in my face and flashing news and the like. You know, you have to be careful of the type of information that you're surrounding yourself with. Um, and that can either be really good positive information that helps your day be a little better or kind of nasty information that drags you down. And yeah. one of the first times I was chatting with Joe and I said, oh, it's really nice that this app does reviews. And Joe corrected me and he said, they're not reviews, they're raves. You know, this is not Yelp. This is something where people can get excited about it and share a really positive experience. So if, if an app's not in Tastemade, then probably maybe there's nothing to rave about, you know, if there's no restaurant in there. So yeah. the idea is as soon as I look, at least I found when you look at something, it's something you can get excited about, and that's the kind of thing you want to actually have in your face on your watch or on your TV. Yeah, with the, with the dearth of all the information that's coming at you, our whole thing was what Tastemade's all about highly, highly curating everything that you're seeing. So you should only... Our, our stance on it was you should only be talking about the restaurants that are important or the places that you are really important and that matter and that are the best because then you don't need to search through all the stuff. So if I can now bubble that up to your watch or to your phone, it, it's not like just a bunch of notifications that are just constantly happening just because you happen to be near a place that you may not even like. So our, our whole thing was being very careful about information overload and really trying to curate more than we are let, asking you to search. We don't want you to ask, actually don't want you to ask, to ask you to search for anything because we think search is... Search is a little different. We have more data now that we can make a personalized experience and push it to you, so why would we need search, right? So it's a, a little bit of a, again, a design uh, challenge, uh, trying to figure out how do you push versus what do you, um, what do you get from the, from the user, so. Okay, so your experience and success is a, have a lot of value. Uh, however, you still need to have lots of expertise uh, and resources to build and maintain your apps. So if each of you gentlemen can um, comment um, and on uh, things like app design, UI, UX, and app performance. Um, and if there's one thing, keeping in mind, if there's one thing you want this audience to remember besides the great party tonight, what would, <laughs> what would that be? Uh, yeah, I think I, I can take a shot at the first, uh, take a first shot at it, but I think it really is don't overfeature your app. Like, f specifically figure out the problem you're solving and be laser focused on, like if you think you need 100% of a problem solved, take only 10% and just code that part, get that working, and then build off of that, iterate off of that. I, I think the, the problem we have today is that, you know, we get stuck in trying to put too many things into the app and then all of a sudden it becomes like, well, what's the identity of your app? 
But if you start very specifically, and sure, you're going to grow your app, and it's going to be different. It's going to mean more to everybody later. But if you just grow and really cement your ownership of a very specific action, which is, you know, like the other day, we, I'll give you an example. We launched a feature where we turned every one-minute video into an a eight-second loop. So we took all the highlights. We, we, we applied a technology uh, kind of like algorithm against our whole library of these videos. And we took out the snippets and assembled them into a really artistic loop. And now you can text those across any device to your friend and say, do you want to go to this restaurant? So it's like an evite with a loop in it. And that whole thing is like, that's, that could have been the entire app. I didn't maybe have to do any of this. You know, I, I just kind of like, what we're seeing is that the engagement on something like that is very you know, incredible because it's, there's no friction to it. It's universal. It goes across every communication. It doesn't matter if, what your phone you have. So I think things like that are very important when you're designing. Is I think we tend to over-engineer and overshoot when we build apps. And, and the problem with apps these days, I actually loved the web a little bit better back in the day because you can, I could literally change something in a matter of seconds. Uh, you don't like that user? OK, I'm going to change it. And I could re-push. And uh, oh, there's a bug? Great, I'm going to fix it. But now I've got to compile and I've got to get App Store approval. It's definitely easier a little bit on Android to do that than it is on iOS. But you know, there's, it's, it's like we're back to the compiled software days, right? Where everything has to, there's a whole run up, there's a whole, uh, the product design has to be more calculated. So you're doing a lot of things without a user telling you if it's good or not. And that, that I think is kind of dangerous. So my, my, if you leave the room today with one thing, I think it's get your, build features as, uh, as small as you can, but do fast, you know, pushes. Like constantly build, be building on something and getting a lot of user feedback because the user is the one that is your, you know, you're building it for the user. They're your product manager is alongside <clears> you. So if you're building something that you think is right, but they don't think it's right, then you're just guessing. You're guessing, and you could be guessing for months. And then you're like, oh, crap. I've been doing this for six months, and I'm wrong. Now I've got to redo it, and then I've got to do another six-month cycle. So I think you've got to really shorten those cycles, and you've got to get to the user as fast as you can. Rich? So there's this famous uh, Star Trek episode uh, called the Botany Bay, and in this one, that's the first time uh, Captain Kirk meets Khan, and you might know it, you might remember it, but you know Khan, who's been in cryogenic sleep for like a couple of centuries or something, <laughs> he finally pops up on the Enterprise and he looks around and uh, he sees all the technology that they have, and you know they even had early tablets, you know, on the Enterprise that they're carrying around, and he says um, somewhat uh, mournfully to Captain Kirk that uh, your technology has increased and you've got all these amazing things that you've done, but humanity itself is still the same. And I'm very disappointed when he does all this con thing. So, so this is going to sound kooky, and you know, maybe as a technologist I'm not supposed to say these things, but um, I think we can trust in the technology. We're all developers here. We're all doing fantastic things. We've got like, partners like Samsung that are helping us with all these things, and we know we can solve techno technology problems. But um, at least for me, um, what I see is what Joe was saying, that you know, finding real problems for real people that, um, that we can address, for me, that's the hallmark of really excellent software. So you, am I the only person that when you're driving around and you have Waze or the Garmin or something, I feel like I'm the machine and it's the master telling me what to do? <laughs> so I think we kind of need to make sure when we're designing software that we address real human interest things. Like the beauty about Tastemade and why I was so excited is that it's taking something like that we all share and we've shared for millennia perhaps, you know, meals and experiences and stories and all that kind of stuff, and we're using technology to somehow expand that and make it better. So. Um, my advice is to keep the human in it as much as we can. Yeah, yeah, and um, I mean, it, it's like I said previously, the, the you know functionality, having something a, a killer features uh, is essential to what you want to do to make your success, make your app successful. But um, again, if if your app is misbehaving on that phone, uh, those yeah. customers are not going to give it a second chance. So my takeaway would be, um, you still need to focus on fundamentals um, to make sure that that phone doesn't kill the battery. It doesn't uh, you know, impact that person's data plan too much. Um, and I uh, encourage you to try out uh, the product. It is free. Um, and we have the URL up there earlier, um, ATD dot de rather, developer.att.com backslash ARO. Um, and then if you uh, want to find out about um, additional platforms, because we, we've been pushing connected car as one additional platform, and this is just that would be just one additional screen, mm -hmm. um, as well as other uh, platforms and APIs. You know, j join us in, uh, in uh, January. Okay, Great. so we have time for a few questions from the audience. Do we have a microphone.
So you take in basically, you're doing all the editing basically, right? Most, yeah, most of yeah. it. So, for instance, can you apply this to YouTube users? Because the number one problem YouTube is, users have is basically getting their videos out of time. Yeah. And getting the hits out, right? So the problem they have is editing. It's not the actual shooting. It's like, oh, I have to edit, I have to put a soundtrack, I have to do everything, right? Yeah. Why can't you apply that? Can we apply that app to yeah, we actually do that. We have a very large YouTube network, and um, and I think that that question comes all down to formats. Not every every show on YouTube. There's a lot of different formats. There's guy yelling at camera format, which is most of YouTube, um, and then there's guy with big hamburger. That's another two thirds of YouTube. But there's like there's a lot of those formats, and then there's the beauty girl format, and then there's the cooking show format, and then there's the video game trailer format. I mean, so I think what what we've been thinking about too is could you. Could, uh, the art is in making the constraint and saying these are the decisions. I'm telling you, again, how to be more creative than you actually are. So I'm telling you what decisions to make. So I think that would have to be across multiple formats. So you'd have to go into every category and say comedy, you know, games, sports, and you would have to do that. And we have done that in the past. Some people have hacked the app and are doing, like this one woman did a shopping video. Somebody did a video of them doing a touring like um, somewhere in Thailand. I mean, there's all these different things that have happened. I did one about, um, I bought a Chewbacca hoodie and it was the coolest thing I've ever bought in my life. So I did like this unboxing video. Those are big videos on Amazon, or I'm sorry, on YouTube, on YouTube the unboxing video. That's like a huge thing. So that was my idea of like, again, you can take the format and you can almost hack it you can do a lot, but we're not explicitly telling you make unboxing videos, but it's not very hard to tweak it and say, use this instead of talking about the restaurant, talk about the unboxing process. So, yeah, so you can do it, but my, 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 my um, advice to you there is that it has to be formatted. I think that's the difference. Everybody, you know, you, you may not know it, but everything you do is to some extent formatted but that you watch when you're being programmed to. House of Cards is the same as some other show you used to watch that is cool, you know? So I think that's, that's the thing with us. We, it, it really is art and science, and you know this probably more than anybody. There's a certain show format that people just know, and you don't want to retrain people. You know, they, they know a certain format, they're expecting a certain thing, so don't change it too much. But the goal is to get the content published. That's what I think everybody says when they see the Tastemade app. They're like, oh, you at least made it possible for me to get these videos out, as Why opposed to not. We are, we're moving, our whole company base is more on travel and lifestyle, food and travel lifestyle. So we're, think of us as like what Scripps Networks and Discovery are to cable. We're not CNN, so we're not Vice. Vice is Vice. Vice is great because they do their whole thing, but we're never going to do news because our whole concept on, that, that's just, it's just a viewpoint you take. But I think it's very important to, again, how you design your products. Yeah, and I think we're, 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 we're doing it uh, with a lot of different things within the lifestyle category, but then in order to keep it great, where the name Tastemade stands for something, we can't probably do sports right away. But maybe uh, 10 years from now, you do sports. But you get my point. It's like, we're going we're gonna to stay in the area that we think is, um, matches our brand and is on voice, and then we will continue to expand. But. Okay, well, I want to thank everybody for coming out. I want to thank my uh, panel. I thank appreciate you. you guys' time, and um, thank you. Enjoy the party. Right. <laughs>